the name of this session is called of this webinar health the hidden violence of the race and i would like to give the floor to uh, Julia Onabonjo and Edouard Matoko, who is Assistant Director General for Priority Africa and External Relations. Uh, thank you, Tabwe. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you uh, this afternoon to this uh, webinar on Earth, the hidden violence of the race. And on behalf of uh, Madame Audrey Azoulay, the Director General of, uh, of UNESCO, I'll uh, welcome you. Um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, a timely uh, webinar. Uh, C'est un uh, webinaire qui arrive uh, at the end of uh, the day. À la fin de la have uh, good recommendation for UNESCO or for all, all of us. Pour UNESCO, pour nous tous, d'ailleurs. We'll Et have uh, a good uh, knowledge une bonne connaissance de la situation and we can, uh, act et que nous aurons, nous aurons la possibilité d'agir tous ensemble selon ces recommandations. Donc, uh, chers, chers invités, éminents professeurs, know, right, uh, chers collègues docteur Ramiz Alagarov, sous-directeur exécutif du Fonds des Nations Unies pour la Population, distingué invité, cher Anjali, euh, bienvenue encore. Euh, à bien des égards, les événements que nous vivons en ce moment sont exceptionnels. Inutile de les rappeler, mais je souhaiterais quand même rappeler qu'il ne se passe pas seulement dans, en Europe ailleurs, il se passe aussi en Afrique chez nous. Et que ce sont des, ce sont des événements qui marquent l'histoire, notre histoire. Euh, la crise du Covid-19 a eu des conséquences néfastes sur le plan économique, sur le plan social, pas seulement sur le plan sanitaire. Il a remis en question certaines des valeurs que nous défendions tous. Il a remis au, au jour des missions qui, pour certaines communautés, sont difficiles à mettre en œuvre. Comme disent les sociologues, ils ont le, la crise a créé une disruption sociale et dont il faut tenir compte pour l'avenir. Cette crise, bien sûr, et le, le virus en lui-même, a su s'appuyer sur l'ensemble des réseaux d'échanges matériels pour atteindre à une vitesse qui nuit une dimension globale, frappant le monde sans aucune distinction. Les experts vigilants se sont aperçus que dans certaines sociétés, les personnes d'ascendance africaine étaient à la fois davantage exposées et payaient un tribut beaucoup plus lourd que les autres populations. À cet effet d'ailleurs, il y a une quinzaine de jours, nous avons également organisé une consultation sur cette question avec les afro-descendants de la région andine, Pérou, Colombie, Venezuela, Colombie, sur cette question. Où il est apparu à l'évidence qu'au problème d'intégration sociale, au problème d'exclusion, situation d'exclusion, d'éducation, accès aux soins de santé dont ils étaient déjà victimes, venait s'ajouter également la crise du Covid. Mesdames et Messieurs, nous avons aujourd'hui la chance d'être en présence de spécialistes et merci de nous accompagner cet après-midi parmi les plus éminents pour nous aider à comprendre cette crise, à comprendre ce qu'est ce virus, si biologique soit-il, et comment il réagit, comment il fonctionne en tant qu'agent social. Et comment, dans ce sens, il est révélateur ou multiplicateur de dynamique sociale existante, qu'elle soit positive en termes d'inclusion ou négative en termes de discrimination ou de manifestation d'actes d'intolérance et de xénophobie et de racisme, pour ne pas employer ce mot. Le Covid-19 donc, n'échappe donc pas à cette règle. Cette conférence intervient aujourd'hui également à un moment singulier où partout dans le monde, les jeunes, 
de toute origine, manifeste pacif pacifiquement pour dénoncer le racisme sous toutes ses formes et se lever contre les manifestations les plus barbares dont nous sommes tous témoins. Et je le disais en introduction, pas seulement à Minneapolis, ne nous glorifions pas, mais aussi en Afrique, entre nous. Je pense que tous, sans être idéalistes, nous pouvons trouver en ces jeunes gens du mouvement Black Lives et les jeunes gens qui manifestent en Afrique, en Europe, aux États-Unis et partout dans le monde, une similitude avec les mouvements de jeunesse des années 60 qui militaient pour les droits civiques aux États-Unis, pour simplement la reconnaissance des droits humains, le combat pour la justice, la dignité humaine. Le pasteur Luther King avait un rêve. Et nul doute que s'il était encore avec nous aujourd'hui, il répéterait ce même rêve que nous connaissons tous. Cette discussion sur l'articulation entre race et santé va démontrer, s'il en est besoin, que dans de nombreuses sociétés, la vie des Noirs, et je traduis, a eu sens qu'il faut respecter. J'aimerais adresser, mais plus pour terminer, mes chaleureux remerciements à, à, à Oufa, au docteur Amiz Alabakarov, sous-directeur exécutif, qui nous accompagne aujourd'hui et qui, évidemment, dans leur domaine de compétences, qui sont les questions de famille et de population, ont un grand rôle à jouer et peuvent induire un changement de comportement, de mentalité et d'attitude. Sur le front de la lutte contre le racisme et les discriminations, vous savez tous très bien que l'UNESCO a accompli de, nombreuses, de nombreux projets, que ce soit à travers l'histoire générale de l'Afrique, que ce soit à travers les déclarations sur la Convention et la diversité culturelle, et plus précisément aujourd'hui, ce projet de la route de l'esclave qui nous réunit, autour desquels on peut débattre, on aura à débattre, et qu'on peut considérer qu'en même moment de l'histoire de nos sociétés, et que la mémoire nous oblige à respecter. Je voudrais encore une fois vous remercier d'avoir d'être aujourd'hui avec nous et nous comptons beaucoup de vos délibérations pour avancer dans nos différentes institutions, pour avancer avec des recommandations, des résolutions sur cette question. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci encore et Taboué, à toi la parole. Merci beaucoup, M. Maclocco, pour vos mots qui ont parfaitement posé en fait, les enjeux de cette discussion. Je vous le disais, la préparation de ce webinaire a été pour le projet La Route de l'Esclave la possibilité de démarrer une collaboration étroite avec le Fonds des Nations Unies pour les populations. Je suis donc particulièrement heureux d'accueillir le docteur Ramirez Alcabarov, sous-directeur exécutif du Fonds des Nations Unies pour la population par intérim. Monsieur, la parole est à vous. Euh... Merci beaucoup euh, pour avoir me donné la parole, pour m'inviter aujourd'hui. Euh, je veux exprimer mes euh, appréciations la plus profonde et chaleureuse à M. Fermin Eduardo, Eduardo Matoko, assistant directeur général pour Priorité Afrique et Réservation Externe de l'UNESCO. Je veux saluer chaleureusement tous les participants, euh, l'expert distingué, les professeurs, euh, les partenaires, euh, les sociétés civiles, les, les délégués qui sont joignés aujourd'hui pour vraiment discuter euh, la question la plus pertinente euh, qui, qui nous vivons un moment historique aujourd'hui dans les luttes pour les droits humains et on voit vraiment euh, la situation difficile euh, parmi les populations afrodescendantes. Euh, le mouvement Black Lives Matter euh, et la revue mi parcours euh, de, um, des cadres internationaux euh, qui étaient annoncés par les Nations Unies euh, pour, le, pour les afro-descendants. C'est un moment une très historique pour nous de vraiment consolider la manière comment nous, nous regardons et comment nous approchons les problèmes de développement socio-économique, les problèmes de santé et toutes les complexités autour du dilemme de l'afro-descendant. À partir de ce moment, je vais continuer mon discours en anglais et je vais transférer le français à la fin. Dear colleagues, dear friends, Let's face it, 
The problem we are taking to look at today has been there for centuries. People of African descent have been marginalized, discriminated against, and geographically segregated for a long period of time. They've been regulated to areas with lowest levels of development, little or no access to public services. They have high level of literacy due to poor access to public policies and structural barriers to quality education. Often, people of African descent had limited access to employment or were underemployed and are unemployed and therefore are historically more exposed to crime, violence, pollution, and natural disasters. And specifically, I would like to talk about women of African descent who carry a heavier burden. The intersection of gender and race poses on a woman of African descent even more heavier burden because she is a carrier of the family. She is a care provider for the children. And yet she is vulnerable and is a subject for, and of multiple and intersectional forms of discrimination. Often they have limited access also to maternal, sexual and reproductive health services. They are very vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence, including rape. And often they are uh, marrying early and that results in early pregnancies, which uh, results also for women not being able to uh, develop her full potential. The, these women are very disproportionately uh, victims of sexual exploitation, abduction and trafficking. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean region is home to the largest population of uh, people of African descent. And uh, today, during the pandemic of COVID-19, uh, we all could see that uh, this uh, systemic poverty, systemic exclusion, and systemic lack of access to services translates in high levels of mortality, and the people are suffering the most. That is why we have developed our programs to work together on specific issues. We have organized um, uh, various activities. Our office in Brazil organized a meeting together with the racism and health thematic group uh, of the Brazilian Association of Public Health, Abrasco, to understand the impact of COVID-19 on the people of African descent. We will continue to provide technical assistance and advocate. Uh, recently, we have published a specific report, Implications of COVID-19 for the Afro-Descendant Population in Latin America and Caribbean. That was just issued and that makes specific recommendations. These specific recommendations ensure that response to the COVID plans at the national and local levels guarantee the full protection of the people of African descent that strengthening the intercultural response from the health sector, we need to guarantee all people of African descent equal and uninterrupted access to health services. Women and girls of African descent must be protected from gender-based violence. We must ensure that people of African descent have access to essential basic services, all social services during the pandemic. Children, adolescents, and young people should have an interrupted access to education. And we should develop mechanisms for information, communication, and participation of people of African descent in the process of managing the crisis. So we listen to the actual needs of their communities and how to address the problem. Uh, uh, I know we haven't got that much time and uh, uh, we have a distinguished panel of uh, experts that will um, uh, present different viewpoints and uh, will uh, consider various aspects of uh, exclusion. But of course, with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, these uh, issues have been exacerbated. I should like to thank UNESCO uh, for the partnership, but I would like uh, to ensure that uh, we, uh, well, the uh, UNFPA is uh, determined to uh, continue and implement uh, targeted uh, programs with a view uh, to uh, helping Af the Afro-descendant uh, community to address uh, all these issues. Thank you once again for uh, giving me the floor and uh, giving me this opportunity to attend this webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for these uh, opening words. Uh, this uh, shows clearly uh, the role of UNFPA in uh, trying to 
uh, help uh, specifically the afro descendant communities but the history of uh, slavery or uh, the history of discrimination is also the history of resistance and resistance is often often uh, held and carried by artists now because of the time difference uh, we could not have a live performance but we'll have one video and i'll give you uh, one uh, interesting uh, story when uh, South Africa was still uh, suffering from apartheid, he uh, wrote a piece uh, for uh, Desmond Tutu recorded with Miles Davis. And so let's watch this uh, video by Marcus Miller. Dear Mr. Finman Edward Matoko, Assistant Director General for Priority Africa and External Relations UNESCO. Dear Mr. Julita Onabanjo, Deputy Executive Director, AI, UNFPA, distinguished professors, my dear Anjali. We're going through a strange, confused, but also hopeful moment in our history. In our personal and professional life, most of us are still deeply affected by the unprecedented COVID-19 crisis, especially African-American, Native American, and Hispanic minorities. Then, when at least in the US, we thought that we were about to finally get back to some semblance of ordinary life, another brutal and savage assassination of a black man by the institution that was supposed to protect him. George Floyd is an international symbol recognized across the world, but with him stand Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Breonna Taylor, and many other black women and men murdered by police just because of the color of their skin. We're at the point where enough is enough. How can we live in a country built for the most part by the labor of enslaved black women and men and still have the strong feeling that in this country, black lives don't matter? So when young people are proclaiming during their protests that black lives matter, it's actually more than just a slogan. It's the essential reason for us being here today. Wherever they were enslaved, people of African descent fought for freedom, justice, and dignity. After many battles and with the support of their allies, they finally managed to kill this monster that was the slave trade and slavery. But the shadow of slavery is always with us, polluting our social life, denying justice and dignity for black people all around the world. This shadow has deeply corrupted all our institutions and the sense of equality that's supposed to lead our democratic societies. This meeting is particularly important because most of the time when we think about racism, we don't think about health. We think about education, housing, job opportunities, but we never really seriously consider health, although it's the essential element to life itself. This meeting aimed at considering race and health together is important in this context to understand the deep impact of race, even in what we may label as death by natural causes. My role as spokesperson for the Slave Roots Project is to ensure that the story of slavery, the story of my ancestors, is not forgotten. And I would call out to other artists also to promote through their music, through their art, to promote inclusion and the rights of Black people around the world. I'd like to thank UNESCO and the Slave Roots Project for continuing to give people the opportunity to understand how real the consequences of slavery still are today. Before starting with our distinguished keynote speakers, I want to invite Anjali to say in the language of music some words to a song that is now all over the world, a powerful anthem against racism. Nous avons donc eu ce magnifique message de Marcus Miller. That's a beautiful message by Marcus Miller. Uh, very often artists are the uh, flag bearers of uh, resistance. They, uh, they sing to save our dignity and to uh, restore our dignity. You have many uh, artists who have uh, sung this song and Angela through uh, her song will tell us about the horrors of uh, racism that is still very much around. Angela, it's all yours, take it away. Thank you. My name is Angeli. I'm 13 years of age and I'm uh, here in Paris. And today uh, I am uh, delighted to uh, uh, take part in this, um, this webinar. 
Thank you uh, so much uh, for inviting me. I would like to thank UNESCO uh, for this initiative. And uh, let me just uh, remind you that I'm only a budding uh, musician. I play the flute, the piano, and I sing. I sing uh, the opera, uh, classical uh, song, but I uh, also uh, love uh, modern music as well. And there are two songs I would like to sing. The first one is uh, a Strange, Strange Fruit by uh, Billy Holiday. Uh, I think this is uh, a momentous piece, uh, very much uh, topical, considering the issue we are addressing today. Here goes, Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday. Thousand trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the Black body swinging in the thousand rain, strength is hanging. From the top of the pastoral scene of the gallant stars, the golden eyes and the twisted mouth. Sand of magnolia, sweet and fresh. Then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind. To talk, for the sun to dry, for the tree to dry. Here is a strange and bitter cry. Merci beaucoup, Anjali, pour cette très belle interprétation. Thank you, Anjali, for this wonderful rendition. Sur ces très jolies notes de musique, je propose donc qu'on ouvre le, notre discussion. On this note, the section is that we open this discussion. We have some excellent panelists who are going to help us to understand the challenges that we face today. Historians like to say that history is the mother of all science. And indeed, in order to understand the present, we have to, apologies, in order to understand the present and the challenges of the present, we have to understand history. 
First of all, we're going to welcome Miriam Cotillas, the historian director of research at the CNRS and the former president of the French Committee for the Memory and the History of Slavery. Professor Cotillas. <laughs> Voilà, je, je, je voulais vous remercier donc de, de m'avoir invité, de remercier l'UNESCO. Thank you for inviting me. I'd like to thank UNESCO, the Slave Root Project, for allowing me to take part in the seminar. Beaucoup d'émotions en fait en prenant la parole après une. It's a very emotional moment for me to take the floor after such a moving rendition of this song, a song which reminds us of the darkest moments in history, the most violent moments in history, which are made topical again, which are made current again on a regular basis. I'm a historian specializing in the topic of slavery and post-slavery, the effect of slavery in contemporary times, in other words. And due to this unfortunate pandemic, the issue of the relationship between health and slavery arose. I didn't really see things in that light in the past. But as Marcus Miller has explained, the issue of health is key. And that is my first point. I'd also like to add that I've worked extensively on issues of race and the construction of race. So what I'm going to try to do this afternoon is to intersect the history of slavery, issues pertaining to health, as well as issues of uh, violence related to health that are, have unfolded throughout the history of slavery as a historical fact, whose reverberation in current times um, question us and uh, push us to denounce this indefinite violence that is produced by slavery. So this is what I'd like to talk about. I'd like to talk about care and um, the purpose of the issue of health and to demonstrate how issues of health um, for some are related to welfare, whereas for others, this issue relates to work, to labor, and to the profitability of labor. In other words, race explains these differences between what pertains to well-being and what pertains to health. And these are distinctions that it's important to make because throughout the history of slavery, if you look at health, the health of, of slaves, of those that were reduced to slavery, the issue boils down to labor and the profitability of labor. So on the one hand, the body of those reduced to slavery has to be fed. Their bodies have to be protected, um, in quotation marks, of course. And the body of the slave also has to be controlled in the production of their labor, but as well through abortion. It is controlled through all of the practices that are considered as deviant, such as eating um, earth. And through all of these moments of rebellion, uh, women's abortion, and taking ownership of the bodies of women. This also is related to the issue of rape, 
rape which is not seen as problematic but as historians we look at it as problematic uh, there's also the issue of the control of suicides of slaves when we talk about care or health of slaves we're not talking about well-being of course we're talking about control racialized control racialized bodies whose purpose is production, whose purpose is entirely defined by labor relations. And this is akin to what Michel Serre has said about the uh, current state of health of mankind. This is a situation which was mentioned by an author, uh, Lionel Maga, who wrote the history of the butterfly, or the, the drunkenness of the butterfly, and he quotes Michel Serra and says, oh, the, those low latitudes, these are the mortals known as men. And under the word men or mankind, you could have uh, slaves, but also the higher spheres where immortals uh, drink ambrosia and float about in perfect well being whilst the other half works under dire constraints. The term of the good health of slaves is used again in historical terms under an entirely productivist perspective, but it's also mentioned in an entirely ideological angle, an entirely racist angle. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to quote uh, French examples. So I do apologize. I cannot extend those examples beyond the borders of uh, France. A few months ago, there has been a French television show where somebody called Christine Angot talked about slavery and uh, talked about the good health of the slaves. And there seemed to be a consensus about this idea on the television set, but also through the comments that were made. The good health of slaves was used through this ideological angle, and it was a way of removing the responsibility, the weight of uh, slavery and the consequences that this has nowadays. So rather than looking at history and seeing how history produces racism and discrimination today in contemporary times, which is something that is broadly admitted. There is an ideological interpretation of these facts that refers to the good health of slaves as though to uh, remove any responsibility but also to um, clear ourselves about the consequences of slavery. Another French example again, for which I'd like to uh, apologize. Well, only very recently, a left-wing French politician, Julien Drey, talked about the Black Code and said that the Black Code was almost a policy of the heart to protect slaves. So as you can see, there's a productivist uh, historical reality, which is retranscribed in a current setting. 
In this context, as a historian of slavery, the issue of COVID-19, and this is something that arose uh, much before we started talking about the um, occurrences of police violence that took place in the United States and in France as well, so well before that, so the idea was to take note of the echoes of the history of slavery and post-slavery, all of those familiar echoes that we could find in this modern context, in this modern situation. And if you take an overview, you can see that all of the research that's been conducted take place in sort of cloud of meaning and that everything that was written about the end of history in other words a moment when there's a sort of balance or a resolution of the tensions between past and present well there's no such thing there's no such thing as this end of history all of the tensions that have risen throughout the history of slavery are being reiterated in modern times. And from a heuristic point of view, this is really worth looking into because this shows that the history of slavery is a counter proposal in opposition to a very liberal discourse. And this connection between past and future. First of all, there's the intrinsic violence of social relations generated by economic globalization and the connection of the various parts of the world that we used to experiment arose through COVID-19 for all of the social stakeholders. This revealed that uh, uh, there were real borders in terms of healthcare, geopolitical inequalities as well, which became much clearer. And there was a very interesting counterpoint for a historian of slavery, which was that Africa seemed and still seems to have been somehow protected from the pandemic. Well, this could be an argument against the so-called end of history, but we'll have to see how the pandemic unfolds. What has also been shown is that the racial categories that have arisen from the history of slavery, which has uh, come up with representations, continues to explain a number of brutal treatment received by people perceived as being um, the result of the history of slavery because they are black. Before the killing of George Floyd, before the reopening of the investigation uh, on the killing of Adama Traoré in France, it became clear that police practice was clearly racialized and that there was a very restrictive conception of citizenship underpinning this, even though we happen to live in countries that keep asserting that citizens are all equal and that keep asserting that access to rights are the same for every citizen, for everyone. So we have seen that these categories arose much more sharply through the events of the pandemic. This is something we've heard in the opening speeches now. The most dispossessed were the subject of the 
particular violence because their relation with the risk of the pandemic was much higher than for other social groups. The frailty of life itself was revealed. The frailty of life is something I'd like to underscore because for researchers who work on the history of slavery, this is a notion that is very pointed. This is something that we experience every day, but the living conditions by the management of social relations and by the illnesses and diseases that they suffer from. So all of these elements and feelings combined were uh, researched by writers more than by artists. And when I talk about artists, I'd like to refer to Aimé Césaire, who said, my mouth is the mouth of unhappiness that has no mouth. And I'd like to focus on the fact that historical research is enshrined in this dynamic. And this is where the relationship between past and present can play out. But we have to take very seriously the issue of resistance. It's not just rhetorics. This is what was mentioned earlier. Now, for many, many years, the resistance of slaves to the regime they were under was viewed as purely anecdotal. It wasn't looked upon as a real political project. And this was a case for a very, very long time. Now, historians of slavery are looking into this very political dimension closely nowadays, especially by using the term enslaved, which might be anecdotal for the United States, but in France, we still talk about the term esclavisé or enslaved. Uh, it's something that's under heavy discussion. Now again, to make a connection between the history about memory with memory and uh, and current times, I'd like to underscore the issue of fatigue, of exhaustion. This is something that is prevalent in the narratives of those that were enslaved. The exhaustion due to the enormous weight borne by the system of slavery. the exhaustion brought by the constraints, by the violence. I don't want to make any simplistic connection between past and present, but this comes as an echo to all of the testimonies of anti-racist activists who talk about this fatigue this exhaustion that they have because they keep having to keep a record of discrimination, discriminatory words or acts. So here I refer not to systemic racism, but ordinary racism, everyday racism. So race fatigue, race exhaustion, which permeates lives and which has a cost. It has a very high social cost. In addition to this exhaustion, there is brutality, race brutality, which is a brutality exerted on race. 
And there's an outcry which crosses oceans, a sort of anthem, a repetition throughout all of the situations of police violence. I can't breathe. This simple sentence, I can't breathe. This sentence, I can't breathe, reveals the imprisonment that one might feel, that one does feel in a racist system, in a social system based on this permanent recurrent experience of discrimination. Black Lives Matter, une voix qui s'ouvre pas seulement aux États-Unis, et à un niveau, à un niveau extrêmement, extrêmement global. Voilà, je vous remercie. Bien, merci beaucoup, euh, professeur Cotillas, pour cette euh, réflexion qui nous permet certainement de nous comprendre que le racisme euh, est, un, est à la fois une production et un avatar de l'éclairage qui continue de se des choses. Alors, sans plus tarder, je donne la parole au professeur Nancy Kreger de l'université. Professeur, on parle de vous. Thank you. I need to, okay. I'm very honored to be part of this global event. In my 10 allotted minutes, I will speak about structural racism, COVID-19, and the stories that bodies tell. I begin as I start all my talks by acknowledging that as a US person in Boston, Massachusetts, I am on indigenous land and I pay heed to critical indigenous thinking. And I also speak at a time of great outrage, grief and social mobilization over police killings and structural racism, both profoundly intertwined with COVID-19. My three key points are first, there are terrible inequities reflecting structural racism and social injustice in who is being exposed to the virus that causes COVID-19 on account of their living and working conditions, and these inequities can be prevented. At issue is who can versus cannot afford to work from home, let alone has a home, and if they do, have space to self-isolate if infected, and if an infectious worker who does versus does not have safe working conditions or is provided with adequate personal protective equipment. Second, there are terrible inequities in who is more likely to die if infected, given pre-existing health inequities involving cardiovascular disease and diabetes and excess exposure to pollution. And third, there are terrible problems in how the data are being reported by public health agencies, which makes it hard to see and address these inequities. Remember, as you look for these data for the U.S. for June 22nd, taken from the Hopkins website, which shows that the U.S. regrettably leads the world in case and death counts, every tested person, every one of the 2.3 million confirmed cases, has worried about what will happen, as have their families and friends. Every one of the nearly 1,200 people in the U.S. who have died have families, networks, and neighborhoods who are grieving, translating to millions affected. And only recently, after considerable hue and cry, has the CDC included data on race, ethnicity, and COVID-19, which makes clear that this burden is inequitably distributed. The rates of hospitalization and mortality are three to five times higher among U.S. non-Hispanic Black persons compared to white persons, and these risks are also higher for other populations of color. Limiting interpretation, the CDC fails to include data on occupation, income, education, disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, or incarceration status. And here I note the age-specific racial ethnic inequities in COVID-19 mortality, which we have newly documented, are extraordinarily high among working age adults, on the range of seven to nine times higher 
for black, non-Hispanic, and Latinx populations compared to the white, non-Hispanic population. Indeed, higher in just about every age group over 25 for all other racial groups as well. How then to interpret these racial ethnic inequities? Theory is key. On this slide, I show the overall framework of the ecosocial theory of disease distribution, which I first proposed in 1994 and have elaborated since. And I also show its direct application to analysis of racism and health, concerned with levels, pathways, and power, and also time in relation to both individual life course and historical generation. Ecosocial theory seeks to explain population distributions of health and health inequities. A central focus is on embodiment, referring to how we literally incorporate or embody biologically our societal and ecological context, thereby producing population patterns of health inequities. This theory clarifies that there is not just one pathway by which structural racism harms health. There are many, including economic and social deprivation, excess exposures to toxins, hazards, and pathogens, social trauma, health harming responses to discrimination, targeted marketing of harmful commodities, inadequate medical care, and both ecosystem degradation and alienation from the land, especially but not only for indigenous peoples. The eco-social constructs of agency and accountability further clarify that racism, not race, is causally what's relevant. At issue is who benefits from, not just who is harmed by structural racism. Noting that in the US, white settlers imposed enslavement on both imported Africans and indigenous peoples. This tracing of causal arrows from racism to embodying injustice to health inequities is diametrically opposed to the dominant view, which draws the arrow from quote unquote race construed as biologically distinct groups to racial differences in health status and culture. Reckoning with health inequities requires reckoning with embodied histories. As to the value of grappling with embodiment, consider the words of Claudia Rankin, an African-American poet who in her award-winning prose poem, Citizen, an American lyric, wrote, quote, the world is wrong, you can't put it past you. It's buried in you, it's turned your flesh into its own cupboard. Not everything remembered is useful, but it all comes from the world to be stored in you, end quote. The image from a New Zealand Māori presentation on historical intergenerational trauma tells a similar story, literally rooted in colonialism and racism, with the trunk containing the political and social mechanisms at play, and the branches and leaves expressing the resultant adverse outcomes, including but not limited to health status. Roots also are key to endurance and strength and growth, and new indigenous and African-American histories and activism emphasize renewal, continued resistance, resilience, and strength in the face of daunting odds, drawing on history to imagine and advocate for a more equitable and sustainable world. It is essential to be clear that COVID-19 hit a world already driven by inequities, this slide shows the already all too familiar data, which critically give the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. We live in a world of growing social spatial polarization with ever greater concentration of private wealth as epitomized by the factoid that in 2018, 26 persons in the world owned as much wealth as the poorest half of humanity, down from 43 in 2017. In the US, where the top 1% own a greater share of their wealth than their 1% counterparts in various European countries, three men now own as much wealth as the white bottom of 50% of the US population. Enormous wealth gaps by race ethnicity are on the rise, and intergenerational mobility is on the skid. At the bottom of the slide, consider these data from the new weekly US Census Household Pulse Survey designed to measure the economic, social, and health impacts of COVID-19 both before and after COVID-19 hit, that is looking at mid-March and then also the beginning of June, among households with children, Black and Latinx households were between two and 3.5 times more likely than white non-Hispanic households to report they sometimes or often do not have enough food to eat. Added to which, in early June, among renters, Black and Latinx households were twice as likely as white non-Hispanic households to say they had no confidence or only slight confidence that they could pay their rent. You will not find data on COVID-19 and socioeconomic position and barely any on race ethnicity in US health agency reports. Instead, most of the US data on COVID-19 and health inequities is being generated by journalists as shown by the pastiche of articles I've been collecting since the start of the pandemic. Reminiscent of how the Guardian newspaper set up the counted in 2015 to 16 to tally police killings given fundamentally flawed official US data, with research from our team showing that over half the deaths are not counted in US vital statistics. 
It was journalists with the Atlantic who set up the COVID-19 tracker, including a race tracker, to augment data not being reported by the CDC. The New York Times and the Washington Post have been leading with data visualizations about the social and spatial distributions of COVID-19 in the US. And as remarked by an historian colleague when she saw this map at the bottom of my slide, in the New York Times regarding COVID, chronic disease and COVID-19 susceptibility, quote, aside from West Virginia, it looks like a map of slaveholding in 1861, or I would add even this new updated map of US lynchings, which dovetails with my quoted remarks and the long histories of inequities that underlie inequities in COVID-19 exposure, infection, and death. Here I show the results we did of the first study of its kind in the US, where we documented the excess burden of the surge in mortality in this time of COVID-19 among communities of color and low-income communities in my state, Massachusetts, both separately and combined. We did this by comparing the death rate for all causes for 2020 versus the average for 2015 to 2019 on a weekly basis, and we did so in relation to the social and economic characteristics of the zip codes in which people live. The advantage of this approach is that it captures all deaths, including COVID-19 deaths that were misclassified, plus takes into account the seasonality of death rates. We use four measures, three of which I show here. First, the percent of people below poverty. Second, the percent of crowded households. And third, the percent population of color. The fourth measure pertained to racialized economic segregation. For each measure, the graphs show the 2020 mortality rates by two week time period. On one side and on the other side, it shows the much flatter mortality rates for 2015 to 2019. Notably, all three measures show the same terrible facts, that the death rate surged much higher among communities that bear the brunt of racial and, ethnic and economic injustice. While this might not be surprising, it's still essential to document, and it is critical evidence needed to inform policies about neighborhoods, workplaces, and routes that connect them, understanding that first, Household crowding is itself a consequence of lack of access to affordable housing and lack of access to a living wage. And second, racial ethnic composition reflects long histories of redlining and other types of segregation and is tied to increased risk of inequitable exposures to air pollution and other environmental hazards, which exacerbate the severity of COVID-19 if infected. And just to underscore, it's not as if these patterns are unique to Massachusetts. Here are results of the first study we did, also the first of its kind in the US, whereby we analyzed death rates solely for COVID-19 deaths for all US counties in relation to these same social metrics. And as you can see, the highest death rates for COVID-19 occurred in counties with the highest poverty rates, the highest household crowding, the highest proportion of populations of color. These are systemic problems structured by social injustice. In summary, on the slide, I list three key steps for action. First, to get better data with the intent of doing a better job of second, preventing transmission, and third, developing and implementing apt economic, social, and health policies. We need data on not only race, ethnicity, but the social, economic, and ecologic context so as to contextualize people's individual stories and illuminate the socially structured constraints that limit people's ability to stay safe. Prevention of inequities and exposure is key, as is prevention and redress of economic harm, tied to inadequate policies to protect economic well-being during the necessary lockdowns to protect community health. And these are both distinct from what needs to be done to reduce mortality inequities tied to pre-existing health inequities. Vital action is essential to prevent the inequitable suffering now bound with COVID-19. In closing, we live and die embodied. It is long past time for our science to integrate levels and timescales of embodiment from structural injustice to submolecular levels across historical generations, with an eye towards revealing what it means to embody dignity, equity, and joy. Let us do our work, including for COVID-19 and health justice, informed by history and a vision premised on social justice and human rights, along with deep recognition of our interconnection with and dependence on our wondrous and threatened planet. And may George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and so many, many others whose lives are cut short by police violence, rest in justice, and may the families and friends of all who have died from COVID-19 join with them in grief and with the energy of youth rising for a more equitable and sustainable future, help repair this world. Thank you.
Merci, Professor Krieger, pour cette présentation. Thank you, Professor Krieger, for this uh, presentation that fits the racial uh, dimension uh, in, in the US. And uh, right away, we will receive uh, Professor Ruha Benjamin and give her the floor. Professor. Thank you so much to the organizers, um, everyone behind the scenes who've gathered us today, to my wonderful colleagues, Professors Kotias and Krieger, and especially to Anjali for starting us off with that beautiful rendition of Strange Fruit. Let me begin um, by acknowledging that we're in the midst of a triple plague, the plague of COVID, of police violence and of policy violence in which anti-black racism structures vulnerability to all three racism does a lot of things it can mean a lot of things and so let me suggest among other things that racism is a form of theft we know that it has justified and animated the theft of land labor and lives that it has also animated the stealing of people's health, of their opportunities and more. It also animates the, the theft of our dignity, our ability to trust one another, our connections, our sociality, the very thing that we take for granted, this thing we call society, is under siege in part due to racism and anti-black racism in particular. So I want us to think about how racism distorts our vision. It's not simply an absence, it's not a not knowing, it's not simply ignorance, but it's a distorted way of knowing and seeing the world, one another, even ourselves. And so we have to think about in this moment, how is racism distorting what we see around us, how we see these triple plagues. And so we know, for example, that this distortion affects people beginning very, very early in life. It's not just simply police profiling, but preschool profiling. We know that colleagues at Yale School of Education did a, a study a few years ago with preschool teachers and put eye tracking technology on them and told them to look for challenging behavior. And those teachers consistently looked to the little black boys in the room, even though they were engaged in the same forms of play. And so it doesn't just start with policing and the most spectacular forms of violence, it's the everyday forms of violence and distortion that begins even in our education system. The way that people understand what's happening in terms of the facts, we can present them with data showing racial disparities in COVID mortality, racial disparities in education or healthcare, in our carceral system. And because of the stories that they tell that intervene between their eyes and the facts, distorted outcomes prevail. We know, for example, colleagues of mine at Stanford conducted a series of studies which uh, go under the title numbers don't speak for themselves in which they presented white americans with racial disparity data in the prison system and what they found was using statistics to inform the public about racial disparities can backfire worse yet it can cause some people to be more supportive of the policies that create those inequalities why is that because of the intervening stories, the interpretive frameworks, what stands in between someone's eyes, someone's mind, and the data are all kinds of narratives. And that's why I appreciate so much my colleague Nancy Krieger talking about the stories that bodies tell. We have to become as rigorous around narrative as we are around statistics. Let's start now with some stories. Beginning with Ohio resident Aaron Thomas, who tweeted, a few months ago. I don't feel safe wearing a handkerchief or something else that isn't clearly a protective mask covering my face to the store because I am a black man living in this world. I want to stay alive, but also stay alive. Staying alive, but also staying alive expresses the longing to survive a biological threat and the multiple social threats that make it hard to rest. In fact, 
Some, soon after Aaron's tweet, two black men wearing hospital masks recorded themselves being followed around and kicked out of a Walmart store by an officer. Meanwhile, a black man was dragged off of a Philadelphia bus by four officers for allegedly not wearing a mask. The mask in all cases was never the issue, covered or exposed. It was always blackness, blackness, blackness. Pathologizing blackness has led, for example, to the first person in Britain to be arrested under the Coronavirus Act was this woman, Maria Dinu. We know that pathologizing blackness is what led to a black doctor in Miami who was on the front lines testing the homeless of the virus who was then arrested in front of his own house for not showing ID or rather for not showing mandatory deference to an officer as the officer said, you should refer to me as sir or sergeant when talking to me. Pathologizing blackness is what leads the US Surgeon General to tell black and Latinx people to stop drinking and smoking to protect against the virus, which is a page ripped out directly out of the culture of poverty playbook that blames racialized people for disparities in health or otherwise. When it comes to the converging pandemics of COVID and police violence, the form of black pathology that pisses me off the most is how the medical establishment doctors the truth. Quoting George Floyd's initial coroner's report, the autopsy revealed no physical findings that support a diagnosis of traumatic asphyxia or strangulation. Mr. Floyd had underlying health conditions, including coronary artery disease and hypertensive heart disease. This original report was straight out of the medical racism playbook. Floyd's family was forced to hire experts to issue an independent autopsy that concluded his death was indeed a homicide. But not only that, they learned, the family learned that Floyd, who had lost his job as a result of the pandemic, had also previously tested positive for COVID. Threat upon threat upon threat, converging pandemics. So whether black people die at the hands of police or as a result of the pandemic or from deadly policies, underlying conditions of individuals rather than the sickening conditions of our societies are a ready and predictable alibi for the powers that be. Pathologizing blackness, lest we forget, is profitable. It produces a population of people who can be experimented upon and then disposed of, as when leading French doctors had the audacity to suggest on live TV that a coronavirus vaccine should be tested on Africans because they are, quote, highly exposed and don't protect themselves. Fortunately, in the age of social media, this particular form of anti-Blackness was swiftly refuted by people around the world almost as it was happening, by those who insisted that Africa is not a laboratory and Black people are not guinea pigs. Whether we're talking about France's 35-year medical campaign throughout Central Africa, in which people were forcibly examined and injected with medications with severe, sometimes fatal side effects. Or we're talking about the United States, 40 year public health experiment on black men in Tuskegee, Alabama. The history of medical racism demonstrates that racism is productive. And by saying that, I'm not saying that racism is good, of course, but in the literal capacity of racism, to produce things of value to some, even as it wreaks havoc on others. Many of us are still taught to think of racism as an aberration, a glitch, an accident, an isolated incident, a bad apple in the backwoods and outdated, rather than as innovative, 
systemic, diffuse, and attached incident, the entire orchard, in the ivory tower, in the tech industry, in the medical industry. Racism is even embedded in many of our technologies where blackness continues to be pathologized under the guise of neutrality. For example, although hospitals are not supposed to discriminate based on disability status, race, age, religion, or based on someone's ability to pay, those who are healthier and fitter are given higher priority when it comes to receiving many scarce resources like ventilators. But who tends to be healthier and fitter in the first place? And importantly, why? As one Philadelphia-based doctor explains, if we strictly adhere to a save the most lives principle, we will be treating more white people, more men, more wealthy people. Black people are dying in record numbers from COVID-19, so this ethical oversight may already be playing out, she says. We can't say that we aren't discriminating based on race or ability to pay while algorithmically prioritizing the most likely to survive. The very idea of fitness, after all, has long been a euphemism or code word for judging whose life is valuable and whose disposable. This is what gets buried beneath the seemingly objective algorithms that hospitals use to decide who gets life-saving resources. These technical systems risk codifying a eugenic approach to human life in which ableism, racism, classism converge operating together to make poor, racialized, and disabled people's lives expendable. Not inevitably, but predictably. Ultimately, the pathologization of blackness motivates deadly policies and a gross underinvestment in a social safety net, while at the same time, a gross overinvestment in policing, prisons, military expenditure. In the US, we have health policies that make people sick, education policies that breed ignorance, labor policies that produce disposable people, housing policies that manufacture scarcity, and environmental policies that ensure our collective extinction, not by accident, by design. This reality, however, is not inevitable. Rather, the outcome of choices that people and institutions make to invest in some things and not others. Together, we can and must insist on radically different values and investments. And no investment is too small. So my closing thought is this. If this virus has taught us anything, it is that something almost undetectable can be deadly and that we can transmit it without knowing. So doesn't this imply that small things, seemingly minor actions, decisions, investments, have exponential effects in the other direction, affirming life, fostering well-being, and invigorating society? My hope is that where, wherever in the world we are, that we work to make justice contagious in all its forms. Thank you for your attention. Merci beaucoup, uh, Professor Benjamin, for this. Thank you, Professor Benjamin, for this uh, brilliant presentation. And this is very much in line with uh, Dr. Krieger's presentation. And this uh, shows uh, the two dimensions, the experience lived by individuals and the underlying theory. But I would like to give the, uh, the floor at professor, to Professor Adisal from the University of the West Indies. Bonjour. And I'll share my PowerPoint. I just want to say how very pleased I am to be part of this. I want to thank the organizers. And I'm also very pleased with the previous two presentations. A lot of information, a lot of vital and important information um, that 
must be shared and that was shared um, rather well. And so I had done this before and we had done share screen. We had kind of prepped it and it worked. Um, are you seeing my screen now? No, not for the moment. Okay, let's do share screen again. And um, Yes, it's working now. All right, excellent. Thank you so very much. I want to start off because of the two previous presentation and also because of the preamble of the song in looking at the context of the Caribbean. And I want to dedicate this presentation to George Williams and Noel Chambers, two men, one, one man, um, Noel Chambers, who died uh, 40 years being imprisoned in a term, a legal term that's called in the pleasure of the governor general was waiting trial. And there are several such poor black people in Jamaica and other Caribbean islands who have been imprisoned for more than 20 years waiting trial. And this case of George Williams, uh, Noel Chambers who died a couple weeks ago have brought light to that. And it speaks to the larger, you know, in the Caribbean, we like to say we don't have racism um, because we're a predominantly black nation. But colonialism has uh, precipitated a class structure um, and the vast majority of black people are at the bottom. And if you're particularly poor and uneducated, like Noel Chambers, like George Williams, then you languish in prison for 40 years without trial. And this really speaks to the condition of so many of our people. So today I'm looking at the impact of COVID-19 on vulnerable women and children in the Caribbean and looking at some of the social determinants of health. And what we know is despite the Caribbean being this site of vacation paradise and we're opening up our borders even though some of us don't believe that's a wise thing because tourism has become our primary mode of um, industry so we are allowing the tourists back in um, despite some of the challenges that this might have on our population. So when we think about a state of holistic well-being, we're talking about a complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And the vast majority of women and children in the Caribbean still do not exhibit these things. They still do not have running water. They still do not have electricity. Many still uh, wash at the rivers or what we call standpipe. So the social, social determinants of health, social and physical circumstances affect their risk in a very tremendous way. Uh, so we're looking at the gender and we're looking at the divide between income, education, exposure to violence and neighborhood. Uh, the vast majority of our women uh, are without income because they're either Higla, women who used to sell on the streets or in the markets, uh, women who were, who were the women who were of a better class or better economic factor who serviced the tourist industry. Uh, many of whom don't have enough high school education, so they, they would qualify as um, not complete in high school. They tend to live in environments that is exposed with violence and neighborhood. I think many people know the statistics of Jamaica, Trinidad, um, where our violence ratio is uh, some of the highest in the world. Uh, so this is the condition that faced most of our women, which obviously ex is exacerbated by COVID-19 because there are no resources. And the statistics we get from our government is that at least 35,000 children in Jamaica have not been educated in the last three months because they don't have access to any of the technology that makes it possible. And we know that that data is underrepresented because there are far more children in various rural areas and even inner city communities that do not have access and will not have access. So we're talking about what are the non-communicable death rates in the Caribbean, and these are some of the data in terms of how it affects women and men. Um, people in um, 
with under the COVID-19, people with non-communicable disease are more likely to be affected by COVID-19, that was said by the two previous speakers, uh, because of various health factors and not having access to any of the uh, health factors that are available to them. So we find that uh, women and children in inner city communities, women and, and children in the rural communities, that are now plagued because of the shift in diet. And I won't even go into um, how that is impacted by how we, what we're importing. So we find that diabetes is on the rise, cancer is on the rise, and many of those other things that were not part of the Caribbean landscape are now on the rise. And that is uh, attributed to the change in diet, lack of exercise, and those kinds of things. Uh, for COVID-19 and women, 1.5% uh, concentration of gross domestic products has already been estimated uh, from, lost from the Latin America and the Caribbean. And so the economic impact is greater for women and particularly greater for women that are marginalized. Um, what we are faced with is gender-based violences and our various databases have shown us that since COVID-19, exponentially increase in gender-based violence. In Jamaica, we have been really racked with a lot of um, double uh, murder suicides by partners or husbands or ex-boyfriends. And uh, also this year and beginning from last year, we have been impacted greatly in terms of number of our girl children who have been raped and also um, decapitated or other horrendous actions that we had not seen before. So that, sorry, I went a little too fast. So I want to just go back here. So while we know worldwide the ec epidemic is there in terms of one in three are victims um, and nearly one in four out of all of the families that are victims, uh, in Jamaica this becomes um, much more exacerbated. And it's also true for the rest of the Caribbean because we don't have enough social services in place to mitigate against the violence. And of course you understand, we understand the cycle of violence similarly like we understand the cycle of racism in that as women are perceived to rise and Jamaica is said to have the largest number of women in middle management. Although when you read the fine prints of the data, you will also see, yes, we have the largest percentage of women in middle management, but they're making 60% of what men in middle management used to make. But they're also bearing the burden of uh, supporting children strictly on their own. And so part of what is being uh, looked at here is as men perceive that women are gaining economic and public um, prominence, then the retaliation and the violence against women increase. That's one of the factors because of the whole patriarchal thing. So gender-based violence in uh, Guyana, 85% of the women killed were murdered by an intimate partner or family-related homicide, and in Jamaica, 90%. And in Trinidad, we have a similar trend. So we see this all across the Anglophone or the English-speaking Caribbean, including the Eastern Caribbean, where the data shows us uh, intimate, intimate partner violence is an issue of grave concern for us in these times, and the figures are alarming. Violence against children. About 45% of the uh, children will face abuse in households that experience domestic abuse. We have a study that was done by UNESCO and, and, and others and UNICEF uh, throughout the Caribbean, a high incident of sexual abuse and now trafficking in the Caribbean, oftentimes associated with uh, tourist areas but also that is compounded by physical abuse, which in a sense is sanctioned by the society based on religious and all other kinds of belief that thinks that it's okay to beat the child. But the, we have to see the line that comes from enslavement, even though enslavement has ended a number of years ago in terms of physical and corporal punishment and how that have been internalized and has been used against our children. So our children in the Caribbean are very much at risk, particularly children in inner cities, children in the rural areas or that uh, areas that are big tourist areas for child trafficking, which is now a, a serious concern in the Caribbean. 
So the most recent data we have is 218 and 219. We see that in 218, these were 2,347 cases of sexual abuse against children. We see the increase in 219, and already from the data and the calls that we've collected during COVID-19, and we understand that during pandemics, we understand that during times of severe um, stresses, that child abuse and domestic violence increases. And we're seeing this alarming increase that's happening in the Caribbean. And we really need to get a handle of it. Uh, so um, 700 children, sex victims, and there's the victims by age. Um, and um, by March, we had 368 new cases and much more that are rising. So incorporating women in the COVID-19 response, we need to look at what are some of the things that need to take place, what are some of the things we've been doing, and how do we need to expand that. So we need to have disaggregated data by sex to analyze and to explain um, and interpret the gender dynamics of COVID-19 to guide the country's response. And we, we are short in that regard in, in order to assess the data, gather the data and then just aggregate. We need to implement measures to specifically address women's dual, and, and it's more than dual, triple burden, and increase exposure and risk to COVID-19 and the unfavorable mental health outcomes as key frontline health workers and care providers, and many of whom are also single parents. And maintains women economic empowerment in terms of income generation, which is very much needed particularly for lower class women, women who have made their living selling on the streets um, by provision of direct compensation to informal workers, including health and domestic workers and others in the sectors most affected by the pandemic. Um, so we want to include specific interventions to prevent um, and address gender-based violence. And one of the ways train, not is trained um, personnel and includes trained police force that can address these needs. We want to introduce, introduce measure that uses the situation as an opportunity to promote um, and re-evaluate the, the role of caregivers in transforming family and looking at responsibilities. Uh, we've been working to bring about, but it's a process and it's a, a continuous process, gender equality as a means to mit mitigate an ex exacerbation of unpaid care burden um, that is prevalent and to incorporate women's voices in decision making um, around outbreak um, preparedness and responses. So we are also entering the hurricane season, which is a worry, a source of worry for us because we have the pandemic um, we have Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter have also impacted Jamaica, and there have been not as many demonstrations, but certainly gem gem demonstration, and the human rights activists and others such as myself, who really want to give attention to the incarceration of men and women, primarily men, in our penal system that have been waiting, languishing for more than 30, 20 years, um, to, to have a trial um, and, and if, and if, if um, Noel Chambers hadn't died in the horrific condition that he died a couple of weeks ago, that would not have been brought to the attention of the world. And so um, main issues affecting Caribbean women is domestic and gender-based violence, loss of jobs and income, and having to stay home and be care, be care, um, give, care providers for their children, um, other people in their household, elder parents, and also now being required to be teachers of their children with a lack of resources, tech access to technology, um, problematic internet and connective services, not having data, and those kinds of things. So this is um, uh, pretty much the issue facing us in the Caribbean that has been exacerbated by COVID-19 and which we're seeking to find solutions that are cultural and economically specific to the region. So I thank you for that. And I think I just want to end because, um, be because everyone has, I think it's important to just, I just want to just read a phrase 
of um, a piece that I have been working on to bring this situation home for George Floyd. His knee on the man's neck, on the man's neck, his knee presses down, the man face on the ground, a knee presses on the man's neck, on the man's neck presses a knee, a neck, a man's knee, a man's neck, a man pin to the ground. Thank you very much. Professor, merci beaucoup pour, uh, d'abord pour ces mots. Uh, très Professor, thank you very much for those beautiful words describing the horrific crime of which George Floyd was a victim. I'd like to thank you for your presentation, which adds an extra layer of complexity. On these themes, the issue of race is not thought of in isolation. It relates to the issue of class and gender as well. Now, I'd like to give the floor to Professor Pablo Gomez of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Professor Pablo Gomez, please. Um, I hope, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. Um, good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, buenas tardes, whatever you are. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, the homelands of Dakota, and of Chihuahua people whose ancestors lived in this region for at least 12,000 years, but were forcibly removed by the U.S. state and federal governments following the Treaty of 18. 32. This is also, as all of you know, the place where George Floyd died at the hands of the police three weeks ago, an event that has yet again made painfully visible the long and brutal history of violence, discrimination, and racism that is inserted in the fabric of our uh, societies. Uh, I wanna, um, now I'm going to share the screen um, with you. All right, perfect. So in the brief time that I have uh, here, um, I wanna share with you some selling points of a research project in which I've been working for the past several years and where I explore the origins of the ideas and notions, many of which have been uh, kind of used by uh, in the fantastic presentations by my co-panelists uh, today. Uh, notions that uh, today most, most of us uh, used to think about the, uh, risk and disease, and more generally the fundamental concepts related to epidemiology and social sciences, and how these concepts, I believe, are intrinsically related to the history of slavery and inequality in the Americas. And um, I, I wanna, wanna, uh, this is kind of some of the archives that I've been working on uh, for the uh, for this project, but I wanna I wanna start with an acknowledgement, and it is that obviously enslaved people were not only the numbers uh, that uh, uh, that appear in these uh, records. They created, as I and others have been exploring uh, for uh, several decades now, rich life worlds um, that were marked by creativity and resourcefulness, in which healthcare was central central space for empowerment for the creation of community and for the uh, uh, ideation of routes for the resistance of uh, colonialism and slavery more properly. So even for the uninitiated in epidemiological matters, the past few months have been a cross course in language risk, disease, and population health. And to give you an example, in Colombia, South America, where most of the historical evidence I'll discuss in a few minutes comes from, information about the COVID-19 pandemic in numerical terms have been widely circulated in a variety of media by the central, regional, and municipal governments, as well as by the media and more largely the general public. And here is a screenshot of the webpage of the National Institute of Health in Colombia. Numbers are clearly the authoritative language to talk about the virus and its consequences. In Colombia, the pattern of the COVID-19 pandemic has followed a route similar to those that were so clearly articulated by my panelists, panelists before. It had been around 71,183 infected people and 2,310 uh, deaths. While cities in uh, uh, like Medellin in the Anderson, uh, you can see my cursor here, um, have had remarkably small cases as a result of early implementation of quarantines and public health follow-up. 
other areas of the country have had large outbreaks. And this is part particularly true of specific sectors in Bogota, the capital city, uh, places like Ciudad Kennedy, and other poor neighborhoods in uh, both in Bogota and in coastal areas in poor cities like Barranquilla here and Cartagena de Indias. Uh, and at least in the cases of the coastal areas, these happen also to be places that are predominantly inhabited by people of African descent. So in addition to suffering the brunt of the disease, it is in these spaces where other consequences of the disease will be measured in tragic numbers, um, numbers that uh, will talk about food insecurity, violence, malnutrition, and other sadly well-known consequences of the rampant and intractable poverty and inequality that characterize life in the Western hemisphere. And, and I just, just want to put this, uh, uh, these remarks in conversation with the, uh, the, uh, all the information that we just receive us. It is the case in the United States and in other places, we have very few uh, data that is specifically um, uh, segregated by race uh, in uh, Colombia. So, uh, but, but the patterns are there and uh, are evident in the work of, uh, as it is the case also here in the United States uh, of journalists. So in other words, race and social class, as my fellow panelists have discussed for other places, matter enormously in determining epidemic patterns or morbidity and mortality. And now I'm gonna take you back to, to, uh, to the, the work that I'm, that I'm doing right now. Uh, and is obviously, I'm gonna take you about several centuries before. So this way of thinking about human bodies, thinking about human bodies and public health in terms of numbers, as much as this appears to be second nature, uh, in uh, our society, what scholars have labeled this uh, risk society, is relatively, in historical terms, new. It was not only until the 19th century when modern concepts of epidemiology and acceptance of math mathematical models for the prediction of the behavior of disease appear. It will take longer for physicians to fully embrace mathematical models of quantification as definitive in the ways in which they should approach patient care. Historians of medicine have traced these developments through the history of physiology, biomechanics, the history of the smallpox vaccination, the history of life insurance, and the crafting of the first tables of mortality and morbidity, among others. They have, in other words, linked the history of the quantifiable bodies and universal bodies as related to the history of the new science, uh, the scientific revolution, and political and medical arithmetic in the late 17th century and 18th century English, French, and Northern European learned circles. In this view, it was then when diseases started to be measured as abstract units that congeal the health bodily status of larger groups to be inserted in a state sponsored enterprises that were susceptible to mathematical training. But I think that these foundational ideas were already in place and circulating decades, if not a circle century earlier in 16th and 17th century Atlantic slave trading societies. And here, I'll take you back to Colombia that was then called the New Kingdom of Granada. Uh, and it is the place of origin that this table that you have in front of you. To summarize my research, that let me to conclude that ideas about talking, you know, using numbers and um, uh, risk quantification to talk about disease and bodies has its origins in the ways in which slave traders calculated monetary gains on the basis of slaves' bodies, their labor, and then morbidity and mortality. Here is one of the documents that I examined in my work and comes from the city precisely of Cartagena de Indias, which as I just mentioned, has been disproportionately affected by the epidemic of COVID-19, and which was then uh, the main enslaved, pod, enslaved enterpod in the Americas. Uh, this is during the, the late 16th and first half of the 17th century. And here, Spanish officials specifically calculated the money that they will make for the purchase and sale of the slaves to miners in the new kingdom of Granada. This is Colombia. They specifically calculated average dead rates of slaves coming from West and West Central Africa during the Middle Passage. This is during their transportation from Africa to the Caribbean. And in the transportation from the city of Cartagena to the mining towns that were some 100 miles away. And they talk about 10% uh, and uh, for the Middle Passage and 3% respectively. And this is based on data, and this is important, they collected from the slave traders themselves. This is from past experience and their ledger books, and the risk and average that this will have for their investments. This is figure prominently in their calculation. In these estimates, they detail the price of barbers, 
medicines, physicians, and funeral expenses for those who died upon arrival. And we have to remember two things. First, that these are projections on the basis of data and averages that were coming from data points of obtained from slave trading boats. And second, that this is certainly something that is very unusual in Nata Herald in terms of thinking about population health at the time. In terms of thinking about health in general, people uh, during the uh, late 16th and early 17th century were thinking about bodies and disease in terms of individual terms. And that is something that you can aggregate and certainly not something that you can think in terms of risks. So this is something that is truly remarkable. Um, by the 17th century, early 17th century, these Iberian slave traders had come to focus not just on individual body diseases, and they were not simply putting prices on human beings. Unlike previous slave traders or anybody else at that point, Atlantic slave traders evaluated slave people corporality in groups, thinking towards future capital gains. To adapt themselves to these new necessities of representation, 16th and early 17th century, mostly Iberian Atlantic slave trading community moved from those older frameworks of thinking about human bodies that were based uh, on uh, individualized diseases to one to conceive of universal quantifiable bodies affected by diseases that could be conceived of as ontological entities. This is diseases as existing on their own. This is something that is new and that most of the literature still associates with uh, changes in intellectual uh, circles at the end of the 17th century. The model that these slave traders, accountants, and physicians involved in the financing, traffic, and purchase of Arctic slaves to the Americas credit allowed for the first time for the quantification of value of groups of human bodies and their diseases that they call lotes, lots, uh, as you see here in these documents, for calculating the odds involved in purchase, trading, and healing, as, 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 as we were hearing in some of the presentations before, of African slaves. But these calculations were made months and years before they had been even kidnapped. In other words, these are projections toward the future. In the 17th, in 17th century, contracts between the Spanish crown and the slave traders, but in the circumstances would measure, not in monetary terms, although of course they will be converted into monetary quantities, but rather in proportional deductions, subtracting from ideal normalized units that in some cases were called, as it is the case of these documents coming from Portugal, pieces de Indias. Here you can see a 6 and 17 contract between the Spanish crown and Genoese financier describing this abstract unit, the PSA de Indias, which consisted of a first uh, rate, uh, this is a quote, first rate male slave aged between 18 and 30 years of age, standing around seven palms of high between, uh, this is five uh, feet, four inches, and the void of disease. And this ideal body, uh, end quote. And this ideal body was, of course, the one that would produce the more capital in mines and plantations in the new world. Uh, and it was on the basis of this unit that you will have deductions. Again, deductions that were calculated uh, on the basis of proportions. Uh, so you will uh, have deductions for being a fino or having gray hair of a third, of a quarta, los of a two or six of a quarta, um, being one eight fourth, being older than 35 years of age, a fourth and a quarter, and so on and so forth. Slave traders thus view diseases as independent phenomena for which the same treatments and numerical predictions of risk for human, for groups of human beings could be applied to different bodies. What is crucial here is that disease becomes calculable and predictable. In other words, I think the mainstream language of public health is infused with a history of unimaginable violence. The apparent dehumanizing nature of the violent logics infused in the history of being studied, I think, still clearly inform the ways we see each other. The afterlife of the forms of valuation I describe above organized not only the propertization of land and life, but also, as we know, the racialized value of human beings with the privilege of whiteness. But there is more. It is inserted in the very ways in which we think about the relationship between numbers and human bodies and the power that those numbers have. And this is this reminds me of some of the comments before about how they have come to dominate public discourse in ways that uh, take away from uh, the lived experiences uh, of disease uh, in, in our times. So unlike what yesteryear heroic histories of medicine would have let us believe, the history of science and medicine has also prominently been connected to the history of slavery, capitalism, and colonialism in numerous ways and not only through the addition of race, a history that is of course central to the emergence of modern medicine. 
But the current the argument here does is the idea that the production of the slave trade, which is in essential terms implied that production of both material goods and social relationships, and by extension of human beings, transform universal relationship with the human body. The grammar of public health, epidemiology, and biomedicine, I believe, sits its early iteration in the conceptual logic appearing in the registration and bureaucratization of the value of slaves and their insertion in the logic of the early modern state and its mercantile economies. In other words, it was through the language of the slave trade that there entered our modern health or medical scriptural economy and became visible and calculable. Thank you very much. Cher professeur, merci beaucoup pour cette très très belle intervention. Thank you very much for this uh, great intervention. Uh, allow me to help us understand how the uh, logic coming from slave trade continues to weigh on which uh, and how the methods basically of uh, the way we continue to think and evaluate health. Thank you very much for this presentation. I would like to now give the floor to uh, Professor Jerima Wernick, Director Amnesty International in Brazil. You have the floor, madam. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you and all uh, who joined us today. Uh, it's really a, a privilege to be here, to hear what I'm hearing uh, and to learning what I'm learning today. Uh, this is my opportunity to bring Brazil to the table, uh, especially the resistance of Afro-Brazilians, uh, that is, uh, it's an opportunity to, to myself to, to highlight the other side of, the, what, of what we are hearing. Yes, black, black population, people of African descent has been victimized by slavery and after that for racism. But there is, on the other hand, a, a whole history of resistance. But first, I would like to bring some data, some information about Brazil and the black population. And I wanted to quote a journalist that this weekend uh, uh, stated on one, in one, his article in, in one of the largest newspaper in the country. He said, Brazilians are less than 3% of the Earth's population, 12% of COVID-19 cases, and 11% of coronavirus deaths. Next day, in the same newspaper, in this week, the last week, the last weekend, Emmanuel Goes, a researcher at one of Brazil's most prestigious public health institution, the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation, wrote in the same uh, newspaper. In Brazil, blacks and brown are 61% of those killed by COVID-19 and 55% of the hospitalized. It is important to highlight here that Blacks, the people of African descent in Brazil, we are 56% of the population. It means something about 109 million people. Different sources point out that Blacks in Brazil, are the we are the majority of those who live in poverty, those who live unemployment without social assistance, those who live in the slums and peripheries of the country's major cities, and the majority in prisons, just like the US. Plus, Blacks are the main victims of domestic violence, the urban violence, and police brutality. Blacks, especially those who live in slums and peripheries, are therefore the high, a highly highly vulnerable group to epidemics, not just this, but all. It will not be a coincidence, but evidence of racial disparities, the active negligence of Brazilian authorities in relation to their duty to, to close the gap and protect the health and life of black population here. Unfortunately, blacks are the majority among COVID serious or fatal victims. And I wanted to highlight that behind this is racism and, and a negligence, uh, active negligence by the authorities. Many years after the Durban Declaration and Plan of Action against, against racism. I would also like to point, to point out that the information that I cite, that just quoted here, came from the 
from media vehicles. It is important to, to, to see that this information came from, is based on researchers and activists efforts to bring to light data about black people and not from official epidemiological bulletins produced by health authorities. In fact, the Brazilian authorities, the federal government in particular, have been sought in different ways to omit the data and on the impacts of the pandemic in Brazil, having been forced by Brazilian justice system to keep recording and release, releasing it according to standards already established. In relation to information, especially regarding racial disparities in health, there are regulations since the late 19th of the last centuries. Thanks to the social mobilization, especially the Black women's movement, to ensure the collection, the analysis, and the dissemination of health, of health information according to race, color of people, as a way of evidencing racial inequalities, but mainly to subsidize public policies that allow to eliminate such disparities. And, all, and of course, to contribute to the promotion of racial, racial justice. In this context, in, in a country like this, COVID-19 pandemic affects us dramatically. Although there have been missed opportunities to block or slow down the spread among us. The coronavirus entered in the country through Brazilian businessmen, public authorities and tourists, mostly white men coming from Europe and United States. And it was not inevitable that it would hit us, the black poor, Islam dwellers, as violently as, as has happened. It came to us initially transmitted in a work, work process, but as blacks are uh, engaging in the provision of service to, services to higher white social classes as domestic workers and workers in urban services. Upon arriving in the favelas, the coronavirus find more than an adequate condition for its propagation. Small and overpopulated houses, very close to each other, communities barely, barely ventilated without basic sanitation. That is, conditions that turns impossible to follow the health recommendations reiterated by the authorities. Stay at home and wash your hands. On the contrary, residents of the slums and peripheries in Brazil, many of them having lost their precarious sources of income, are forced to leave their homes to try to obtain minimum resources necessary for survivors and do not find in the streets what they need. They heard from the authorities that, is, that they are invisible. Therefore, they are not reachable by mitigating and protective protection measures, being led to elaborate alone solutions. Then, this person, these black people, this person who lives in favelas in, in that, with that, that precarious condition, conditions, they start to mobilize local solidarity to retain and distribute information, food, hygiene materials, protective equipment, and water. They organize themselves to achieve and share access, albeit precarious, to internet, which has become the main tool with, with which governments have passed to deliver the inefficient actions and policies. At the same time, those who live in favelas see the increase in violent police rates supported by the fallacy of war on drugs, which results in record deaths, killing most young black men and boys. One example of this has happened with the boy called João Pedro Martins Pinto, a 17 years old, who was killed on May 18th in the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro by a rifle shot in the back while playing with other teenagers and children at home, complying with the determination of the health authorities. João Pedro was hit by one of more than 70 shots fired at the house he was in, 
the author was a state agency, a police officer. We, we did that same week between Fridays in which João Pedro was killed. Another 60 people were killed in five, in five favelas in Rio de Janeiro, including the young Rod Rodrigo Cerqueira, 19 years old, old, killed by police during food distribution. And the same week, residents of Cidade de Deus Favela, City of God, a quite famous one, they were also shot by state agencies. Fortunately, unhit by police shot shooting while distributing food to people in need. These serious human rights violations led to a still provisional decision by the Supreme Court banning or limiting police operations in the slums in the COVID time. This decision has been ignored by state police with no apparent justification. Brazil, unlike many, many countries in the world, has a national public health system, which must be university, universal and guarantee effective health care for all. We have also the National Social Assistance System, whose duty is to bring assistance to all those in need. However, incompetence, negligence, and governmental decisions of the last few years have prevented them to work properly in the, for the, major, the majority of us, a situation that is aggravated by COVID-19. So far, it has been the community themselves the black and brown people who have borne alone with the high costs imposed by the pandemic and mainly by the negligence of the authorities. And this negligence, as we all know, is based on racial and structural racism. Such communities have been taking also the streets because there was no other option than claim that black lives matter and demand answers and policies. They claim, they claim health, they demand an end of the police br brutality and racism. They fight for their lives. As Amnesty International Brazil, we are running a national campaign with these activists and organizations to pressure authorities to assume their responsibilities while there is time to save lives, despite so many deaths. This emergency calls upon all of us. It is critical for all of us, not only Brazilians, not only us Blacks, not only those who live in favelas, it's critical to all of us they, th that they, we don't fight alone. Once again, I wanted to thank you all for this, to, for participating in this debate, and that's it, thank you. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Vamek, pour Thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, this has allowed us to understand uh, the situation in Brazil and its impact uh, in the favelas. Our last expert today, Professor Rose Boswell uh, from the university that has a magnificent name of Nelson Mandela. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak. Um, and I'd like to also thank the organizers for um, inviting me to the special session on race and health. And I'm very excited to have heard the presentations of colleagues from Harvard and Princeton, as well as um, from, from other parts of the world. So my contribution um, this evening here in South Africa is to talk a little bit about um, the situation in the Indian Ocean region, where I have done quite a lot of field research. My discipline is anthropology, and um, my PhD a good few years ago was on the subject of uh, Le Malais Creole, uh, which loosely translated is um, into English, for those who may not be French speaking, is uh, what is the sort of the discomfort, if you like, of people of, of mixed uh, race 
uh, or of mixed cultural heritage. Um, and I embarked on this study because for a very long time, there was very little work that had been done on the slave descendant communities in Mauritius. And um, there didn't seem to be a deep understanding, at least not from a sort of contemporary perspective, on the situation of, of, of people of, of mixed descent living not just in Mauritius, but in the broader Indian Ocean region. But given our topic this evening on race and health, my concern is more with the contemporary, to look at recent history, but also look, to look at the contemporary of what is happening in the Indian Ocean region. Um, most of you may have heard from the news that uh, recently uh, the Prime Minister, at least in Mauritius, declared the island to be COVID free. Uh, that strict measures had been undertaken to implement social distancing, the use of PPE and masking and so on, in order to prevent the spread of the, of, of the disease. Uh, but even so, um, there were a number of people that were affected and it seems that there are some new cases that are appearing again uh, of local transmission. Uh, and we do not know yet where that is going to take us. The situation, however, in Zanzibar, uh, which is a semi-autonomous state that is linked to Tanzania is very different. We know that um, there the government is not necessarily revealing all the cases. There is um, a disagreement as to uh, exactly how uh, uh, the government is, is going to deal with the issue of COVID. The leadership um, of the country is relying quite heavily on people's uh, sense of belief that they will be protected. And of course, we have, uh, you know, very organized uh, social movements and civic organizations that are playing a critical and integral role in spreading uh, information or giving people information about the virus and the way in which it spreads. So in some senses, there are uh, local or civic organizations that are playing a critical role uh, in stemming the spread of, of coronavirus, especially in Tanzania. Very briefly, the story of, of Madagascar is also a, a fascinating one. Both, both Zanzibar and Madagascar, the majority of their populations uh, live beneath the international poverty line. And uh, in Madagascar, what is interesting is that the leadership there has pronounced uh, that he, uh, his researchers have found a cure for COVID in the form of COVID organics and that the children, um, the school going children of the island are consuming this, this uh, COVID organics as a way of, of protecting themselves against uh, the disease. But of course, uh, the world authorities, uh, uh, you know, beyond these islands have indicated that it is not necessarily safe to consume these products as they have not been adequately uh, tested, uh, at least independently. What we know uh, uh, historically of these islands is that they were the um, places where either slaves were taken. So for example, like from Madagascar to the islands of Mauritius, Rodrigue, uh, uh, Reunion and so on. Um, they are also places that have received slaves. Um, and for a very long time, the slave uh, descendant population formed a big proportion uh, of, of the, um, the peoples living there. And um, we also know, just like in the Caribbean, um, we had a presentation earlier, the conditions under which uh, these people li lived and still live today is, is dire. Um, this is especially the case you know, in, in Mauritius, where um, we find, that, for example, that uh, first of all, the language that is spoken uh, that is spoken by the people and is now the lingua franca uh, of the Indian uh, of the Indian Ocean Island, the Creole. Um, for a very long time, that language was disparaged. The local people did not receive adequate health care. They lived in the poorest uh, sections of the community. They were underemployed, undereducated, and um, we also know um, from my own research, but also the research that has been done by other anthropologists in the region that um, the, the communities um, described uh, or defined as Creole, um, who associate themselves with, with slave, slave ancestry, that they also suffered in, in health terms. So malnutrition was a huge, huge problem across the islands in the, in the early 60s, but it was even more so, and it is still is the case for 
uh, people living, uh, you know, the Creole depend, uh, descendants living in, in Mauritius. Uh, we find pockets, you know, of poverty where, uh, uh, you know, people are, are suffering from a, a range of, of NCDs or non-communicable diseases, especially cardiovascular uh, disease. Um, but I think the, 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 the other point which I would like to raise, you know, in this presentation, because I'm covering, in, in a sense, a, a region, um, is that we also need to take into account the long-term uh, psychological effects of racism, you know, on the local populations living in the islands. And I think that is, a, is an area of research that, that needs, you know, further attention. Um, the anthropological research that I did revealed quite clearly the sense of disbelonging, um, the stress uh, that comes from, you know, the, the burden of, of, of racism. Um, one of our colleagues earlier on talked about the weariness uh, that, that comes from having to bear the burden of racism. This is something that was very, very clear in the research that I did and, and how, how local communities basically strived to um, counter, you know, the, this feeling of weariness, the burden and the stress that basically comes from continuous experiences of racism, whether it was blatant, uh, you know, racism, denial of access to healthcare and jobs, or whether it was aversive racism, microaggressions that people experience on a daily basis, whether they are in formal employment or uh, in informal uh, self-employment. We also know that, for example, that Mauritius uh, um, is, the, the, the slave descendant population there is highly, is also differentiated. So we don't just have people who uh, historically associate themselves with uh, the slave descendants that were living on the island, but that they, some of them came from the Chagos Islands, which is uh, an island that is currently um, still under dispute, you know, internationally. Um, it, it was recently, I think last year, um, there was a declaration that the islands should be returned to Mauritius, uh, but that the UK um, has refused this. Uh, so there's an international dispute there, and basically the, the islanders were forcibly displaced, and they were um, placed in, in animal shelters uh, in, in Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius, in the early 60s, 1965, and they were, there was a very high rate of suicide and illness, you know, in this community, and today the psychological effects, um, you know, are, are spoken about, but of course, um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the local uh, uh, media, for example, perhaps doesn't, doesn't pick up on this, you know, to what extent have these, uh, you know, psychopathologies been passed on from one generation to, to the next. Uh, very briefly on Madagascar, because I realize we're running out of time. Madagascar, again, there are many layers, uh, you know, within the social hierarchy. And uh, early uh, uh, historical studies showed that um, not only is there, you know, regional divisions uh, uh, and regional identities on the island, but that there's also a, a very important um, class hierarchy within the overall society, such that uh, in Madagascar, on the highlands, for example, around the capital city of Antan Marif, um, there are people who are described as untouchables, the Antivulu, who, who, who cannot have access to a range of, of, um, uh, of, of services that uh, ordinary people who are not considered untouchables would have access to. So um, in, in, in thinking about um, race and health, you know, in the islands, one has to take into consideration all these hierarchies and differentiations, you know, between the, the different island societies, their particular histories, as well as the, the, the layer of, of, of gender, which was raised uh, uh, again by an earlier uh, a speaker this evening. Um, for instance, we know that in, 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 in Mauritius, most certainly during the lockdown period, that gender-based violence actually increased. To what extent the government uh, it has reported on it uh, remains to be seen because, of course, it's, it is very important because these islands rely quite heavily on um, tourism and they rely quite heavily on a good uh, external uh, perception of the society. Um, there is a, there is, I suppose, a tendency to downplay, you know, sort of negative experiences um, that are happening within the island societies. Uh, but gender-based violence is, you know, was on the increase, especially in Mauritius under the lockdown period. 
um, and uh, women's access to healthcare uh, was also uh, uh, jeopardized. So um, we need to take these things into account. So in brief, um, I mean, I haven't had the opportunity to say, obviously I'm just talking about the Indian Ocean region. And again, I'm aware of time. Um, the, the situation where I currently am sitting, which is in, 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 in South Africa, is, 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 is even more complex because of the, the, the long history of slavery and apartheid in South Africa as well. And we're seeing the same patterns of discrimination uh, playing out here in South Africa and the impact on uh, local people's health, especially people of color uh, living in this country. The, the most affected uh, uh, communities in the Western Cape province uh, of South Africa uh, are the, uh, uh, what we call here in South Africa, the townships or in Brazil would call the favelas. It, it, these are the areas where people are living in close proximity to one another. They may be homeless. They have the, um, the accumulated burden of, of, of poor access to health infrastructure and they do not have the means to uh, carry out sanitization. So in Mauritius, uh, maybe Madagascar, and we don't know to what extent in Tanzania or Zanzibar, the situation is perhaps on a smaller scale given the population that we have there, but we are seeing it on a large scale here in South Africa, especially in the Western Cape province, uh, where um, the situation is, is aggravated by you know, hundreds of years of, of, of uh, you know, slavery and colonialism, and of course, a, a, a apartheid. Um, and this is the case across the, the, the different provinces of the country, but most specifically the Western Cape province, and then the Eastern Cape province where I'm situated, we're also beginning to see a marked rise, you know, in the, the coronavirus cases, um, and the impact of that being exacerbated by the fact that where, where the communities that are being hit the most are the ones that have very poor access to healthcare. And these are ostensibly black African communities um, that um, have been, um, you know, are, are not receiving uh, the level of aid and support that, that they actually need. So in, in summary, um, just a one line summary, I'd like to say that most certainly I agree with the other presenters that the slave descendant uh, communities in the Indian Ocean region are uh, proportionately um, you know, affected uh, the most by, by coronavirus. Uh, and it's also having not just physiological, uh, it's not just having the physiological impact in the sense of those who have contracted the disease and are now having to recover from it, but it also is having major psychological uh, impacts as well. And that needs further investigation and research. So thank you very much, uh, Tabu, for the opportunity to speak. Merci à vous, professeur, pour cet éclairage, car comme le, le comité scientifique... Thank you, professor, for this uh, presentation. And uh, when you mentioned the history of slavery and the effects uh, uh, of uh, slavery several generations down the line, one tends to look mostly at the African continent, but also uh, the Indian Ocean deserves attention as well. By way of conclusion, I would like to ask uh, Angela Mero from the um, social uh, sector at UNESCO to say a few closing words. Thank you, Tabwe, and uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Amis Adlakabarov, who uh, are in charge of the UNFPA, uh, distinguished professors, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, distinguished guests, and dear Angeli, I should like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for these brilliant and outstanding presentations by one and all. And um, we listened with great care to uh, these presentations. We heard uh, lots of uh, uh, remarkable data. There were uh, remarkable stories as well, some, some uplifting, but some very distressing indeed. Uh, we uh, should like to uh, emphasize uh, the uh, uh, analysis uh, presented here. Uh, we had uh, stories of resilience, we had the case of uh, Brazil, but uh, we also had their uh, academics 
who uh, were very much uh, activists in their own rights. They were not just intellectuals living in an ivory tower. And it was excellent to see uh, speakers as well as academics uh, making such outspoken uh, statements. And um, in a webinar such as this, usually there's some sort of interaction amongst uh, panelists, and but there was such uh, interaction here with the chats. In other words, uh, uh, there were uh, a word of thanks to Jerema of Brazil, and uh, these exchanges were uh, very much uh, present here. And finally, Angeli, uh, a splendid uh, singer, I would like to uh, thank you for your uh, for your beautiful uh, voice, your beautiful music. You uh, have brought us to a, uh, a new uh, world, a new level of uh, contemplation. What I would like to say is that over the past 25 years, uh, the, uh, the slave route, uh, that project has uh, generated knowledge, has brought about uh, scientific networks, but also uh, introduced memorial initiatives worldwide. And this project, the uh, slave route was, of course, supported by UNESCO, but has brought about a uh, or created a memory heritage, which is indispensable to make it part of uh, public knowledge. And the progress made so far is unquestionable, uh, even though uh, a deep knowledge and acceptance of history and uh, slavery such uh, that has not uh, quite uh, come. Uh, to play yet, but uh, this is what uh, Professor uh, Kutya said in her opening statement, uh, and this is very much what I'm saying uh, right here. Uh, this has not been uh, borne out yet. There's still too much subjectivity uh, in the presentation and the study of the history of slavery. Uh, s uh, s slavery or the history of uh, slavery is uh, construed as an indictment of a portion of the population vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other, and as such, it tends to be played down in, uh, the, in contemporary discourse. But uh, now, issues around slavery and the incidents in contemporary society, this requires new forms of thinking, new forms of acting. And indeed, uh, the... Uh, uh, the period of slavery was uh, a period where the uh, entire concept of race was uh, uh, was uh, fabricated, was uh, created, and while this has been overcome as a concept, racism is still very much present, and current uh, events are uh, a sad illustration of that. That was the purpose of this uh, webinar. The idea was to have a uh, high level uh, academics uh, and analysts looking at the effects of the uh, consequences of slavery on uh, the uh, on public health and more specifically in the context of COVID-19. And I tend, uh, I will say that COVID-19 is of course a global health crisis. It is a threat to mankind, but at the same time, we can hope that new opportunities will come about. One of them being that uh, this will create a, uh, a uh, new uh, new take on uh, these contemporary phenomena that need to be eradicated once and for all. Um, I believe uh, all will agree that uh, this uh, exchange has uh, uh, certainly kept uh, has been up to expectations. We've discussed the effects of disease and epidemics. We find that disease and pandemics are not uh, discriminatory in and of themselves, but they do reveal uh, the fractures of society. And we will find that certain portions, the more vulnerable portions of society, tend to be more, uh, uh, more directly affected by, pandem by pandemics. And uh, the uh, analyses we have heard uh, will be just as relevant should have we decided to uh, discuss 
uh, indigenous populations, uh, the various uh, presentations we've heard have convinced us that uh, at the heart of this uh, project, uh, structural racism should be uh, the uh, centerpiece of our uh, analysis. We've seen only recently uh, the terrible demonstration of this, but we can see that uh, uh, racializing, uh, but uh, also class and gender discrimination uh, have been uh, the uh, most uh, dramatic uh, factors of uh, societal uh, disruption. We've uh, had a, a, a talk uh, precisely about gender and we find that gender uh, affects not just, is a matter not just uh, for uh, COVID-19, but for uh, all manner of uh, phenomena. And I would like to hail what was said by Dr. Krieger about uh, the, uh, the health repercussions of uh, discrimination throughout society. And I certainly hope that with our uh, UN partners, UNFPA in particular, we shall be able to uh, continue uh, the good work. And I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you for your attention. That way it's all yours. Thank you to Angela Molo. Now, before letting Anjali Singh again, I'd like to thank our director for making the fight against racism a priority for the Slave Root Project. Today we talked about COVID-19, its impact and what it revealed about the structural inequality of our societies. But what it revealed is that, well, COVID-19 has impacted the planet in different ways for different regions of the world and different communities. And through this meeting, we are paying tribute to all of the victims, all of our loved ones whose lives were cut short. So I'd like to pay tribute through Anjali's voice. But before we listen to her, I'd like to thank all of the people who made this webinar possible, Mrs. Jine Aguacha, Anna Maria Madloff, Erica Dibney, Isabel Jaldina Jani, Mr. Ankara, Charlotte Grabley, Mr. Mohamed Alan, Linda Caceres, Professor Matthews, Nisha Quenza, Laura Bensuso, and many, many more colleagues. I'd like to thank all of these people. We've had quite a wonderful room full of experts. And now I think that everyone is waiting to hear Anjali. Once again, I'd like to thank UNESCO for having invited me. I'd like to thank Mohamed Dalla, as well as all the professors, uh, all of the panelists who were invited here today and who shed light on some issues that I wasn't necessarily aware of in the past. I'm going to sing the gospel song, Amazing Grace. It's a very famous song. This song pays tribute to all of the people whose lives were cut short because of COVID-19 or violence that takes place around the world. It could be a tribute to Manu Dibongo who died recently. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught 
my heart to fear and raise my fear how precious dear that grace appear the hour I first believed amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Bravo. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Euh, merci beaucoup encore. Euh, voilà, ça m'a fait très plaisir. En Thank tout you cas, very much again. It was a real pleasure to share these short but intense moments with you. I hope you've enjoyed it. And beyond the performance, I hope that you found it meaningful because I certainly have. Hi, Rosen, uh, Professor Rosen. I'm come from Mozambique. <laughs> she's not. She's. Merci à vous tous. Merci. 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 Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. Monsieur le directeur. Bye. Bye. Merci. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank okay, you. thank you so much.